Right, so last time we left off with um, kind of going through the morphological changes that are happening in the ovary. Um, left off with the secondary follicle and its particular anatomy with its two different zones, zona pellucida, zona granulosa. Uh, and then you begin to have these cavities that begin to fill to form the preamble follicle. So the antrum cavities will form, and these cavities begin to fill this fluid. As the antrum begins to form and grow, we're kind of working between these two spots on the, on the finger right now, um, begin to fill up the antrum with fluid. Now, there is also going to be some tissue around the very outside, and it's, it's um, more like a connective tissue. It's called fecal tissue. And as the preantral follicle begins to form, the fecal layers undergo a differentiation. And we end up with two fecal layers. The first is called the feca externa. Which is fibrous. And then the inner layer which is more vascular. Okay, so we can get this into vascularization. Okay, so preantral follicle begins to develop the cavities. They become fluid filled. Those cavities are going to enlarge and eventually be transitioned from the preantral follicle into the mature follicle, which typically is referred to by its dividend, which is the grafting follicle. Okay, so the grafting or the mature follicle. And this is actually the structure that is now prepared. You can see that we begin to have um, this much closer contact to the uh, to the outside surface, the, the capsule of the ovary. And so this is actually going to be the follicle that will, um, that will ovulate and release the ovum out into the other cavity. No way. No. So the gravity follicle is going to undergo ovulation. So let's talk a little bit about ovulation. So for ovulation to occur, we have to have a spike in luteinizing hormone. We have to have a spike by luteinizing hormone to facilitate ovulation, and then there are also going to be local factors, ovarian factors that are going to progress ovulation as well. This term ovulation refers to the release of the oocyte. And then there's some other stuff that's going to be released as well. As we break through the, uh, the capsule of the ovary out into the pelvic cavity. Now, as long as everything goes as planned, what's not shown here but is going to be in close contact is the oviduct, the fallopian tube. At the very ends of the fallopian tube, they have these finger-like structures called the fimbria. And every time, every time mom's heart beats, it sends a pulse wave through these fimbria. And these fimbria have a sweeping motion. And so as the egg is ovulated, that sweeping motion hopefully will pull this, uh, get this egg up into the oocyte. So the oocyte. 
that mechanism should end up in the overdrive. Okay. Now, after ovulation, so during that post ovulation period, you can see that you actually have this remnant scar tissue from where ovulation had occurred. So we have this remnant from the graphene follicle, the stuff that converts into, into the pelvic cavity. And as we progress in time, we begin to, to, to heal this scar tissue, and it eventually de develops into a structure called the corpus luteum. So the progression that happens here, remember that we had uh, the fecal interna, fecal interna become vascular. So when the follicle ovulates, the leftover scar tissue begins to fill with blood. And so this initial structure right after ovulation fills up with blood. It's going to be referred to the corpus hemorrhagicum. So the corpus hemorrhagicum occurs. It simulates the healing process. So you really have two different options at this point. The two different options are either that a pregnancy is going to form, we're going to have fertilization of the ovulated egg, or there's not going to be a pregnancy. So I want to start out with if there is a pregnancy. So if pregnancy occurs, we have to undergo this process known as rescue of the corpus luteum. Now, rescue means that it's going to be allowed to persist. It's not going to digress. And generate uh, with time. It's actually going to remain in this corpus luteum structure, and as such, it becomes an endocrine structure. So it becomes an endocrine structure, and in particular, it secretes progesterone. So it becomes an endocrine structure, begins to secrete estrogen, I'm, I'm sorry, progesterone rather. Uh, we're going to find out that that progesterone is actually going to make the uh, uterine lining to, make, to be maintained to thicken, to stay in the nutrient of the protective of what probably is now a implanted fertilized egg. It's going to create progesterone. Um, and that will persist for about 9 to 10 weeks, and then the mother's progesterone kind of takes over and maintains the rest of the pregnancy. So the other option is no pregnancy. And we basically have to um, make sure that we don't have high levels of progesterone because that would maintain the thickness of the uterine lining in the uterus. And so we want to basically go back to a point where we can begin to um, prepare to go back through this Full cycle again. So, with no pregnancy, we want to see normal levels drop. Uh, so, we do not capture the corpus luteum. And the corpus luteum becomes the corpus albicans, which is a degraded or degrading corpus luteum. No longer, it does not have the capability of producing progesterone and nutrients. Okay, so that's the basics of what's happening here. Now let's step back and take a look at some of this stuff in a little bit more detail. 
So at the start of the process, about six to 12 of our secondary follicle are going to start the process. You'll remember that we have our reproductive supply of about 300,000 per ovary as we reach puberty. And so out of those 300,000, six to 12 uh, of the secondary follicles that are just kind of waiting around are going to be triggered to begin to go through this developmental process. However, as you all are very aware, one, typically, Now, there's obviously cases where that's not entirely true, where some of these 6 to 12, 2, 3, 4 of them, they all progress and they do have um, not identical twins that are born. at the same time, they're all coming from different areas. Which, are there, so, if you're a twin, if you're the base of your twins, uh, it's either one. I don't think we're a crazy number of So what happens to the other 5 to 11? Normally those 5 to 11 go through a process, a process known as atresia, so we can say that they become necrotic. That basically just means that they eventually will stop the maturation process and they will go back through a digression or a, uh, a reabsorption process and just get uh, pulled apart. No longer be a follower. So fall apart. Okay, so that's pretty interesting, and so the, the question that we need to address here is why only one follow? How is that physiologically challenged? So why only one follow? And the pervading theory on this is going to be referred to as the dominant follicle theory. Dominant follicle theory. So this idea of the dominant follicle theory is that you're going to have one follicle that for whatever reason develops quicker than the other 5 to 11 that have entered the process. The one mature follicle develops quicker than the other 5 to 11 follicles that have entered the process. At the secondary follicle stage, the secondary follicles are uh, they're sensitive to FSH. Right, so we have FSH sensitivity. And this FSH sensitivity is, uh, it, it varies from follicle to follicle based off of the number of FSH receptors that are present. So what is FSH actually doing here for the secondary follicle? As FSH is being produced, into the blood. The FSH is causing an increase in the number of granulosa cell LH receptors. Okay, so FSH uh, in the follicle is causing, causing the granulosa cells to increase their number of LH receptors, 
when LH binds to this increased number of receptors, each of those individual cells, the more LH receptors they have, the more estradiol those granulosa cells begin to produce their stimulate production. And estradiol has negative feedback on this endocrine axis. Negative feedback. So if you kind of think back on that axis, you basically have gonadotropin releasing hormone. It causes the gonadotropes to release LH and FSH. You have LH, uh, I'm sorry, FSH is stimulating LH production of or LH receptor production of granulosa cells. LH targeting those granulosa cells on all of our different follicles. Estradiol begins to be produced as estradiol level increase that feeds back onto uh, onto the gonadotropes or into the pituitary. Those gonadotropes are stimulated to, or really inhibited, and we have a decrease in the gonadotrope troven FSH LH release. Okay, so this is kind of the mechanism that we expect. Now, how does this cause only one follicle to mature? Well, the answer to that question appears to be that each of the follicles as they begin, they can be ranked based off of this thing called the FSH threshold. In other words, how responsive to FSH are they? Because remember that our secondary follicle is FSH sensitive. And so you're gonna have some of these follicles that respond earlier and some that respond later in terms of LH uh, receptor production, LH responsiveness to produce estradiol. So one of them, with the lowest FSH threshold another way to put this is this is the most sensitive follicle to FSH it's probably got the highest number of FSH receptors and so the probability of this being found by FSH to begin that process is much higher than other follicles and so this follicle, which is eventually going to be called the uh, predominant follicle, this follicle initiates the production of estradiol so that can have a feedback cascade back on to the hypothalamic pituitary gonad axis. And so we get estradiol levels that begin to increase early on as this follicle begins to continue through its differentiation towards the mature follicle. Those other 5 to 11 follicles have not quite made it to this spot. And so all of a sudden, FSH LH levels begin to bottom out because of the feedback from, uh, from the estradiol that is stimulated by this dominant follicle. And this prevents further development. This prevents further development of the other follicles that have been kind of held back a little bit further. Yeah, that should be a Okay, now once we get that dominant follicle, and so for you know two, three, four follicles to develop all at the same time, they probably were all very, very close in terms of their FSH sensitivity, and so right around the same time, right, they um, they caused the changes to occur. They don't uh, have a need for LH FSH anymore as that they're going to continue down the pathway so they all develop. But normally, in the human population, you'll have just one um, follicle that fully develops, one that is 
saved up from the others for a very low FSH. So that one follicle matures. It continues to produce elevated estrogen, which continues to suppress the hypothalamic pituitary canal access through follicular maturation. Yeah, so estrogen just remains hot when they pop. But estrogen remains high, FSA balance levels are low. So any follicle that may still be developing no longer can develop because of the high performance that will allow that development of progress and you know uh, go through the tree that just become a track. Die away. Okay, so that's uh, kind of the gist on what happens with one uh, one follicle to develop. Again, that's called uh, the dominant follicle theory. I want to talk here now a little bit about the FSH secretion. You can see that this is pretty important. This is kind of what uh, ends the whole developmental process to begin with. Uh, and so I want to talk a little bit about FSH secretion and what possibly turns FSH on, turns FSH off. So we have two additional hormones here. Inhibin, which is a FSH suppressor, and acronym. So inhibit and activin, inhibit and FSH suppressor, activin, FSH releaser. And these two genes are coded by the same gene. Right? Coded by the same gene. So I got a bottle here to draw for you. So this is my DNA molecule, or my section of the DNA. This particular gene has three different subunits on it. Now, beta A, alpha, and then beta B. So beta A, alpha, and beta B. Okay? So this gene gets produced, and these are basically going to be the building blocks to produce activin or inhibit, and it turns out activin and inhibit have a couple of different isoforms. And so up here on the top, I'm going to draw out the FSH suppressors. Well, those are just parts of the gene that don't code for the specific uh, gene products that we're, uh, that we're talking about. Okay, so the FSH suppressors, I can use beta A and then alpha. And there is a disulfide linkage helps to hold them together. But this combination here is called inhibit A. But I also can take a beta B and an alpha subunit. And then again, also I'll have my disulfide linkage to structure those together to create a gene called inhibit inhibit B. Okay. So two different isoforms of inhibit, again, all coming from the same gene. 
having FSH suppressive effects. Then on the FSH releaser side, I have a couple different possibilities here. I can actually take two beta A subunits. A A is also a disulfide bridge in here to hold the structure together. And this forms a molecule called activant A. I then also have kind of a similar combination here where I have beta B and another beta B subunit. Got the disulfide bridge in there. And this particular structure forms active in P. And I have one other possible structure here, and that's actually to take a beta A and a beta B. Beta A and beta B. And this is going to form So you have inhibit A, inhibit B, active in A, active in B, and then just normal active. So how does this all fit into follicle progression? So during the primary follicle stage, this is kind of our beginning stage, primordial to primary, one of the things that is experienced is an increase in granulosa cell proliferation. Granulosa cell proliferation. Then we progress into the secondary. secondary stage or the secondary follicle. And during the secondary follicle, we have an increase in FSH receptor expression. Increase in FSH receptor expression, we see elevation of active.
that secondary follicle, we're also going to see an increase in estrogen production in the granulosa cells, and a concomitant increase in the levels of aromatase. Then as the follicle matures, the follicle matures the mature oocyte. It's going to be present. We're also going to have an increase in LH receptors on the granulosa cells. The increase in estradiol production, probably related right to the increase in aromatase activity in the previous, in the previous stage. The increase in LH increase Androgen synthesis. And this is going to be happening in the fecal cells. And we'll observe a decrease in FSH excretion. Kind of go back through all of this is happening. Scroll through it again. So, as the primary follicle develops, you see an increase in granulosa cell proliferation. Then, this forms the secondary follicle that has an increase in receptor expression for FSH activated by activant. So, in the presence of activant, you also see an increase in estrogen production in the granulosa cells because of increased levels of aromatase. Then the follicle fully matures. Mature oocyte is present. It has high levels of luteinizing hormone receptor on the granulosa cells in the follicle. Estrogen production is elevated, continues to be elevated. The luteinizing hormone um, Receptors elevated in the fecal cells, inducing interaction with the LH, uh, LH, LH receptor, causing androgen synthesis, leading then towards more estrogen production as well. And we're going to begin to now see FSH secretion begin to dip down. FSH secretion is dipping down because we now have perceptible levels of inhibitor. Now, we actually still are going to have high levels of activant, but we also have now a third hormone that's added to the mix. It's called folistatin. And this actually begins to sequester by binding to activant. And this causes activant to be So now we're no longer able to go for Inhibitor levels are high, activity levels are high, they repeat activity is bound up on folostatin. So it basically is the group of the equation. Inhibitor levels are high, FSH levels begin to drop in that mature follicle. Now this is also going to affect the inhibitors, right? And this hormone is going to affect the other follicles that are developing as well. Preventing their FSH, um, FSH receptors and FSH interaction from occurring as well. And so those, those get held down and no longer progress. And we have just a single follicle, usually, typically, that goes through this entire process for years. Okay? 
Hopefully that makes sense, kind of what's going on there. I know it's a little bit complex, but. All right, so we talked a lot about estrogen, and I want to talk a little bit about how estrogen is being regulated here. And the predominant theory for estrogen uh, production is called the two cell theory of estrogen production. Two cell theory of estrogen production. hormone binds to the fecal cells. In the fecal cells, steroids containing 19 carbons, so we're going to call those C19 steroids, are affected through some mechanism of action in the fecal cells. One of our C19 carbons that Important here is a steroid called androstene diol. Androstene diol, which is reversibly catalyzed to testosterone. Okay, so when uh, the fecal cells are bound by LH. C19 steroids are affected. Androstene diode begins to be converted into testosterone. Testosterone is then released to the granulosa cells. So that's kind of the first cell, fecal cells. That's um, the first cell in the two cell theory. Then we release to the granulosa cell. Testosterone levels increase in the granulosa cells. And when testosterone is present in the granulosa cells, remember that FSH is the cell, or is the hormone rather, that binds granulosa cells. And we've already seen this, I just mentioned this. When FSH binds the granulosa cells, we see an increase in aromatase activity. The FSH release is facilitated by activin. So FSH increases aromatase activity. FSH release is enhanced by activin. And basically, the biochemical pathway that we're looking at here. That cholesterol is converted over to progesterone. By the way, cholesterol is a number seven carbon molecule. I'm sorry, not progesterone, pregolone, and then progesterone. Basically, have two different pathways now 
to go to this molecule called 17 alpha hydro either pregnolone or 17 alpha hydro progesterone. And these are convertible between so then all of it filters back to here, where now we can produce DHEA dihydroethylenedosterone. This is our 19 carbon, um, our 19 carbon molecules. And so this is this is where we're going. This is the part of the biochemistry that we're going to affect when LH binds to the fecal cells. DHEA can be converted over to andro interstitial Yeah, 17 alpha hydro pregnolone, 17 alpha hydro progesterone. So DHEA is irreversibly converted over to androstenedione. Then we have reversible, uh, reversible reaction here or production to testosterone. There's still C19. And then the testosterone can either be produced with dihydro testosterone or through a carbonate seeking estrogen molecule. This is Anderson diet. So basically, even though I've drawn this like it's all continuous, you have some of this happening in the fecal cell, right? The androstene diode testosterone, and then testosterone moves over to the granulosa cell where it's exposed to aromatase and is produced in a, into estrogen. So it's an estrogen. Right? So that's kind of the two cell theory. LH starts the process in its fecal cells, converting interesting diodes to testosterone. Testosterone continues to granulosa cells. The granulosa cells are stimulated to increase aromatase activity by FSH, being activated by activin to cause estrogen levels to increase. Now, aromatase is non reversible. So testosterone does not jump back from estrogen. Testosterone is kind of estrogen. So that's the two cell theory, but there is an alternative theory. And the alternative theory is hormone binds the fecal cells and this causes an increase in androgens the LH the fecal cells the estrogen the circulation So this here results in um, an increase in androgens. I'm sorry, let me step back. Let me just, let, just ignore this for a second. So LH binds to the fecal cells, and the fecal cells upregulate estrogen, as estrogen ends up in circulation.
this result here in an increase in the androgens than if we have no increase in estrogen, this would result in cell, the, the, the follicle, that follicle becomes red. So the uh, the the granulosa cell. Let me put down the other part. The granulosa cells produce estrogen, and that ends up in the follicular fluid. Right. And so we don't have the two cells working together. Cells and granulosa cells, each is producing their own estrogen. From the fecal cells, estrogen enters into the circulation. From systemic, the granulosa cells produce estrogen. That ends up in the follicular fluid. Uh, the follicular fluid then, uh, estrogen level then, regulates follicular uh, maturation. That's the follicular process. So if we have an increase in the androgens, it does not result in an increase in the estrogens. The follicle is going to undergo a restriction, right? Because we need estrogen in order to have um, follicle strong. And so this is basically the pathway for estrogen secretion through circulation. It does not result in really estrogen affecting the follicle, and so we have granulosa cells surrounding the follicle, producing estrogen, putting that estrogen into the fluid. That's how those follicles are exposed to um, exposed to estrogen for development. Alright, uh, so that's kind of uh, some ideas. Uh, and again, the two-cell theory. I've never surveyed other physiologists or reproductive endocrinologists, but two-cell theory seems to be the more prominent of the two. Uh, there's not many people who would say that it's the alternative hypothesis, but that's out there. So the next step here, we kind of have an idea of how we go through this process. Now, how do we go through the process of ovulation. Okay, and the answer is that we have to have this thing called the LH surge to induce ovulation. And to understand what's happening here with uh, basically a bolus or a large quantity of LH dumping into the bloodstream to induce ovulation. Uh, it's important to remember our feedback loop. So let's take a look at the feedback loop. So gonadotropin releases the hormone, targets the pituitary to cause the FSH, LH release, targets the gonads to induce estrogen release, and then also FSH, LH, target gonad, touch vial releases, inhibin releases, and inhibin is going to come back and have a negative influence on gonadotropin releasing hormone and a negative influence on luteinizing hormone, and then all on the other side have a negative influence on FSH. Really, it's this this whole connection here. Uh, these two are playing to have an estrogen for them to be Okay. So 
So when estrogen levels are high, estrogen inhibits When estrogen levels are high, estrogen inhibits gonadotropin release. With follicle maturation, probably through the two cell theory of estrogen production, development of fecal cells, development of granulosa cells that increases estrogen levels. So as the follicle matures, we eventually have an estradiol peak that forms. Okay. So this is this image here, you have five different windows. You have the gonadotropins, LH and FSH. FSH is this kind of lighter blue color, LH is this darker blue color. So this is the surge, right? This this is levels of the hormone in the bloodstream. Then these are the different stages of ovulation. You can see you've got the follicular development, it's called the follicular phase, ovulation, and then the luteal phase. This is the progression of the corpus luteum. Here's your ovarian hormones. Estrogen levels shown in green. The brown is the inhibition levels. And then I don't know if you can see it as well, but we got some light uh, blue colors in there for progesterone as well. This is the uterine cycle. So this is what the uterine lining looks like. This is menstrual, uh, the uterine sloughing that results in menstrual flow. And then we go right back through this development where we basically cause proliferation of the tissue and then it becomes secretory. We have an increase in glands plus these spiral arterioles that supply blood into the, um, into the tissue. And then we go back into the menstrual flow or what's called the dysphagia menses. And then this is your body temperature. Now, I want you to notice, this looks like you have also this huge spike in body temperature, right? You get super, a super big spike in body temperature. You actually don't. This is 36.4 here, and this is 36.7. So we're talking about 0.3 degrees of centigrade change at the point of ovulation, and then body temperature comes back down. So it's not like it's two or three degrees, but it is a small increase. And sometimes it's pretty hard to detect that with a uh, over the counter or at home uh, thermometer. Okay, so that's kind of everything that's going on there. So, follicle begins to maturate. This results in an increase in estrogen. Estrogen is going to peak. You can see that that peak here in green happens <coughs> just before. <coughs> <coughs> Just before, <coughs> just before luteinizing hormone. I'm done. Uh, uh, what am I doing? Okay, so we get this estrogen peak. It has estrogen levels increase. They'll reach and go above a critical level. And this happens during that peak. So there's somewhere in here where we have kind of this, this critical level that we're going to exceed in terms of estrogen levels. And right around the mid-cycle, there's about a 36-hour window where we move above that critical window. And this, with estrogen levels, move above that critical level, remain there for about 36 hours above that critical level, and this induces an increase in pituitary Gonadotropin releasing hormone receptor. So we're increasing in the pituitary in the gonadotropes, the gonadotropin releasing hormone receptor. And you can see shortly after the estrogen peak, during that 36 hour 
window, we then have a large amount of LH that's released all at one time. So you have this big time release of glutamine hormone. So estrogen induces an increase in gonadotropin releasing hormone receptors. Small amount of GnRH now has a whole lot more target, overstimulates the gonadotropes in the pituitary. Large amounts of LH are released in a very short amount of time. So LH surges to a peak. And ovulation occurs. Now, during that peak, glutamine hormone causes the corpus luteum to form. So, ovulation is going to occur. LH surges, stimulating the release of the oocyte from the follicle. Ovulation occurs. And what's left over in the uh, in the ovary is the corpus luteum. LH is going to have an effect on the corpus luteum as well. So as the corpus luteum uh, goes through progression, you have first corpus hemorrhagicum that forms, right, and we start to respond to LH. What we're going to see is the corpus luteum forms a decrease in aromatase activity. With that increase in uh, aromatase activity, what begins to happen? Estrogen levels begin to drop, and we sort of back up the biochemistry here of steroids. And so then we also begin to see right here this increase during the gluteal phase in progesterone levels. So progesterone actually begins to uh, increase. And that progesterone is coming from the corpus luteum. Another thing that happens is the granulosa cells also respond to the LH. And as the granulosa cells respond to LH, we have a decrease in the negative feedback. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, a decrease in LH and FSH secretion due to the negative feedback. LH, FSH levels begin to drop. And because all of this stuff has happened now during the luteal phase, LH and FSH levels are dropping. Estrogen levels are, are relatively low, but you can see that they're actually still um, pretty high. They're going to actually have another little secondary peak that occurs a little bit later on. Um, but this is the kind of the perfect combination for no follicular genesis to occur. And so after ovulation, during the luteal phase, as progesterone is being produced, we have this small amount of time that's supposed to say quiescent, where the ovaries become quiescent. So no follicular genesis, the ovaries become quiescent. Clearly, it's time to quit.